You've seen the benefits of skimming with rephrasing when there are multiple perspectives in a passage. But what about when there are multiple passages? Paired passages can be tricky. You have to understand each passage, but you must also understand how the passages relate to each other. So, as you are reading, you rephrase to understand what the passages mean. And as you reach the end, you determine how the passages relate to one another. The good news is there's a hint. Check out the information given to us in the description. Let's give it a try. Passage A is an excerpt from the essay, The Anti-Federalists, Number 1, by Brutus, 1787. Passage B is an excerpt from the essay, The Federalist Papers, Number 45, by Plubius, 1787. Okay, so you notice how passage A says anti-federalist and passage B says federalist? This is a huge hint. Clearly, these two passages are on opposite sides of an issue. So, as you read the first passage, you're trying to determine the issue and what position passage A is taking. Then, when you read passage B, you are ahead of the game because you know this passage will discuss the opposite take of the same issue as passage A. Okay, let's see how this plays out with these paired passages. Passage A by Brutus. This government is to possess absolute and uncontrollable power, legislative, executive, and judicial, with respect to every object to which it extends. Okay, so uncontrollable doesn't sound good. <laughs> it is declared that the Congress shall have power to make all laws, which shall be necessary and proper for... <laughs> it is declared that this Constitution and the laws of the United States, which shall be... <laughs> shall be the supreme law of the land, and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby, anything in the Constitution or law of any state to the contrary notwithstanding. Okay, so basically the central government or federal government government has the power, not the states. It appears from these articles that there is no need of any intervention of the state's governments between the Congress and the people to execute any one power vested in the general government, and that the constitution and laws of every state are nullified and declared void. Wow. Okay, so maybe this is too much power if the state governments are not even needed and the laws of the central government can undo a state law or, like, cancel it? So far as they are or shall be inconsistent with this constitution or... <laughs> okay, so the government then <laughs> is a complete one and not a confederation. It is as much one complete government as that of New York and Massachusetts, has absolute and perfect powers to make and execute all laws, to appoint officers, institute courts. <laughs> okay, so the states should be allowed to make laws? Whew, this is pretty dense. Did you notice that the passage seemed a little short? Beware. When the passage is shorter than usual, it is often because the language is denser. On the upside, this means you have plenty of time to stop and rephrase. Okay, let's keep going. So far, therefore, as its powers reach, all ideas of confederation are given up and lost. It is true this government is limited to certain objects or <laughs> some small degree of power is still left to the states. Okay, so again, the states do have some power, but it's really very little. But a little attention to the powers vested in the general government will convince every candid man that if it is capable of being executed, all that is reserved for the individual states must very soon be annihilated, except so far as they are barely necessary to the organization of the general government. Okay, so basically this passage is saying the government is too strong and that the states do not have much or enough power. Okay, so before you even start reading passage B, ask yourself, what is the position taken by passage A? Hmm, the government is too strong and states don't have enough power. Okay, then what's the opposite? Hmm, a central government and states having enough power. Great! The description before the passages really helped us to understand how these passages are related to one another. Unfortunately, this is not always the case. Usually, you are determining how the two passages are related to one another while you are reading the second passage. Let's read the second passage and see if you can understand its meaning and its connection to the first passage. Passage B by Pluvius. Having shown that no one of the powers transferred to the federal government is unnecessary or improper, the next question to be considered is whether the whole mass of them will be dangerous to the portion of authority left in the several states. 
Hmm. So this seems to be asking sort of about the first passage, right? Is the power of the central government too dangerous or too much? The adversaries to the plan of the convention, instead of considering in the first place what degree of power was absolutely necessary for the purposes of the federal government, have exhausted themselves in a secondary inquiry into the possible consequences of the proposed degree of power to the governments of the particular states. Huh. So instead of answering the question about power in the central government, people are asking this second question or idea about power within the states. Wow! It's almost easier to understand what Passage B is about when you think about how it relates back to the first passage. And man, these passages are dense. Anytime you see that a passage was written more than about 75 years ago, you can expect language that you are less familiar with, as well as long sentences with a lot of dependent clauses and many descriptive and prepositional phrases. So what do you do? You rephrase. You stop along the way and say what you just read in your own words. Be general. What is the main idea? Where is this going? But if the union <laughs> be essential to the security of the people of America against foreign danger, if it be essential to their security against contentions and war in different states, <laughs> all right, if in a word the union be essential to happiness of the people of America, it is not preposterous to urge as an objection to a government without which the objects of the union cannot be attained that such a government may derogate from the importance to the governments of the individual states. Okay, so that was confusing. So maybe just take away that a question is being asked, right? How important is the government of the states? Was then the American Revolution affected? Was the American Confederacy formed? Was the precious blood of thousands spilt and the hard-earned substance of millions lavished? Not that the people of America should enjoy peace, liberty, safety, but that the government of the individual states, that particular municipal establishments, might enjoy a certain amount of power and be arrayed with certain dignities and attributes of sovereignty. Okay, so this author thinks that all the people fighting and dying in the revolution was for peace, not to argue about states' rights. We have heard of the impious doctrine of the old world, that the people were made for kings, not kings for people. Is the same doctrine to be revived in the new, in another shape, that the solid happiness of the people is to be sacrificed to the views of the political institutions of a different form? Okay, so basically the author of this passage thinks that the power should be with the federal government and all this arguing about state power is not the matter at hand. All right, there were a few challenging aspects with these passages. The text was really dense with the long sentences and unfamiliar wording. It was hard to figure out what the first passage was really about. Then the second passage wasn't so much better. Although, once you had an idea about what the first passage was about, it was easier to use that to figure out what the second passage was about, since you knew from the description that the authors disagreed. Well, what happens when you don't get such a clear hint in the description about how the two passages are related to one another? You never know what kind of passage you're going to get, but you do know that you can skim over the wordy parts and focus on the main idea. Stop and say a simple sentence using your brain voice. Then continue reading and keep checking in with yourself that you understand where the author is going by rephrasing in your own words. Okay, now go find some articles or older books with dense text and practice breaking the text down and finding those main ideas by skimming with rephrasing. Happy practicing!